ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and we're about to start this session. Good afternoon and welcome to this session on Africa's climate change challenge. Now, Sub-Saharan Africa is widely considered the most vulnerable area of the world to the effects of uh, climate change. Many African countries are already suffering from various forms of climate-related stress, such as droughts and floods and rainfall variability. Now this year, for example, Mozambique was devastated uh, by Cyclone Idai and Cyclone Kenneth, one of the worst natural disasters ever seen in the Southern Hemisphere, and whose damage will cost uh, the Southern African region more than $2 billion in repair. So today, today we're going to be asking what measures should African leaders take to prepare for the increasing severity of weather-related disasters? This afternoon, my panel will also look at the question of resilience and vulnerability and explore solutions in the context of Africa's changing climate reality. Ladies and gentlemen, may I now welcome my distinguished panel, His Excellency Danny Foray, the President of the Seychelles, uh, Director Andisa Mlisa, she's the Managing Director at Observation South African National Space Agency, SASA, in South Africa. Dr. Helmut Fluher, he is the founder and chief executive officer of Weather Tech in Switzerland, and we are uh, very interested to hear about your rainmaking uh, initiative. And Bert Strebel, the managing director and head uh, of the Middle East and Africa, Swiss Re in Switzerland, will be talking about insurance with you. President Foray, I'm going to start off with you and jump right into it because climate change does present quite unique challenges for the small island developing states. And if the world fails to hold global warming, they may disappear altogether. So what is the one step that your government is taking that has had the greatest impact in combating climatic risks, reducing vulnerability and building resilience? I think the number one thing that we have done as, as Seychelles and also as a member of, uh, of uh, the community, is to say that uh, it is our human right to survive. So it is a question of our own survival as, as, uh, as members of, of, of one humanity. So um, climate change is the number one threat to humanity. Not the, not the number one threat to our continent, but it's the number one threat to humanity. So we take it very seriously. So as a small island country uh, with other small island nations uh, within the, the African continent, we have been able to, um, to mobilize uh, the continent. And I'm happy to, to say today that within the African continent, we have one common position in terms of, uh, of climate change. Of course, Africa as one continent is also vulnerable not only vulnerable, but we have the, the least in terms of capacity to adapt. So as a country, we have put in place mechanism. In Seychelles, we have, uh, we have the right national policies in place. And uh, over the last 30 years, my, uh, my government, we have done a lot in terms of creating the necessary mechanisms uh, to put in place uh, the right met, uh, mitigation strategies in terms of how do we uh, create the, the necessary resilience uh, against this uh, number one threat uh, to humanity. So when you talk about Africa has a common climate change policy, though, do you think Africa's concerns are receiving enough international attention? So basically, as a, as a continent, we, we continue to, to advocate. But it all depends on other nations around the world. And uh, in, uh, in December, we will be going to the COP25 as one united Africa uh, to continue to press for uh, the necessary uh, financing in terms of mitigation and adaptation. So, and this was from rising, uh, you know, waters to flooding to a drought across the continent. We've seen it all, and your technology, I'm sure, has been monitoring this across the continent. So let's look at a real-life example here and look at the, the, the situation of Mozambique and Cyclone Idai and Kenneth that caused massive um, devastation there. In terms of early preparedness, early warning systems, did we see that coming? Unfortunately not. And, and this, is, this is one of the things that makes climate change so devastating for countries like uh, 
continents like Africa where we've got the least vulnerable people. And our technologies are meant to enable this from a, from a national space agency perspective, data is the, is the order of the day. We're talking about democratizing data, building platforms and systems that will enable our government to build early warning systems is one of the critical issues. So one of the major things that we're needing to be looking at is that science and data is an enabler in, into this environment. So how do we build early warning systems that are informed <laughs> by data reliable data, timely data, accurate data. And in this instance, we're looking at platforms like Digital Earth Africa, where we're taking satellite data, 50, 40 to 50 years of data. You know, we've been in space. Most people might remember the moon landing. We're celebrating 50, 50 years of being in the moon. That's how long we've been collecting data over the continent and globally, environmental monitoring it, that we can actually ask questions to it. But we're scientists, so for decades, we've been playing around with this data and saying, yeah, 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 you can monitor floods, you can actually monitor drought, you can, you can be resilient to it if you use it this way. But we haven't managed to operationalize it. Digital Earth Africa is one of the key flagship programs that we have now in the continent to say to our governments, here is a platform where satellite data, over 50 years of monitoring, we, we've managed to put it in a platform where it's easily accessible, where it's easily processed and where products are easily accessible to anyone and any man on the street. It's a game changer if you're thinking about it. Now, for Cyclone it Owl, if we actually had a platform like that before, it's a question of people are what governments care about the most. It's all about people, it's their livelihoods. And with data, satellite data specifically, we're talking about the power of where. Where are the likely places where the flooding will occur? And who will be impacted when that occurs? How do you do your evacuation plans? If your roads get, get, get clogged up because you've got so many people that you're needing to be transporting through a particular road, how do you prepare to make sure you've got exit routes? And all of this, especially and with your special data, you can <coughs> actually manage. Now, if we had these early warning systems and, and preparedness up front, what we get to call a disaster, because the geohazards are going to happen. Uh. The rainfalls are going to come. This we cannot change. It's going to happen. But it's how it impacts us as people <coughs> that it matters the most. And for that, we need to make sure that we've got strong enough early warning systems. But we need to make sure that data plays a good part in preparing our early warning systems. So, Dr. Flora, your company um, invented, uh, you know, a, a technology, a system that uh, creates rain and rainfall. And I do want to draw on your example from uh, Jordan, where, um, you know, that uh, technology boosted uh, an increase of about 27% of rainfall over 5,000 kilometers. This can be an answer to Africa's persistent drought situations. Can that be replicated on the continent? Yeah, of course. And we are already talking to different uh, governments. Uh, we started out in 2003 with research work. The Swiss government supported us, and we made tests <clears throat> in, uh, in Arab countries. We worked in Australia. We worked for governments only. The technology is a very environmentally friendly uh, by ETH and uh, Max Planck and others researched, and it's an ionization process, and we cracked the code what happens the hour before a rainfall started. It was known that electricity and other have an impact, but the um, um, computing power of my former companies, I was 94 an internet pioneer here in the forum too, and this, uh, I sold everything and then I went into this and we made so much research and cracked the code after a couple of years. And it's a very complex thing, but the influenced areas are between 5,000 and 10,000 square kilometers thanks to the meteor offices and WMO. We have the data uh, from above, we have our own radars, we have weather stations, and we have the top scientists. The influence and the impact is great. What you just mentioned, yeah, it's not our, we never uh, measure our success, it's always the client, the government. And Jordan was now a long test, uh, it was three years, uh, and a, a long contract, yeah. And the impact is 27% more rain in the 30 year average, and because the surrounding areas are thanks to climate change, 8% uh, less, so it's 35%. Uh, agricultural growth, 30%. And uh, yeah, we were honored last year by the Vatican with the prize to be the world's best solution against migration. And, uh, and they calculated the jury, American universities, that we could potentially help 1 billion people with water and food security. And then I'm traveling now 
with a, which I didn't expect it in the beginning with cardinals uh, through Africa and uh, make our uh, contacts. And what finally to mention, um, I think that it's uh, very the latest minute yeah, to fight the big trouts. What I've seen here the last uh, uh, months traveling up and down the continent, yeah, I must say we have to act with the speed of the problem, not with the speed of some bureaucratic institutions. And then we can have a solution. But for Africa, though, one of uh, some of the big issues would be cost uh, of the technology and uh, uh, transfer of, of that technology. W what would be some of the challenges uh, for a continent such as Africa that is now facing persistent drought in implementing a technology such yeah, as yours? Uh, we, we are since 15 years without competition. It's very, very complex. Yeah? So we are a service. And the costs are uh, one cubic meter of rain is one cent. One cube, and then it vapors 80, 90 percent. And then it stays, and the cubic meter usable water is 10 cents. When you do pumping and piping, uh, then it's around 40, 50 cents. When you do uh, desalination, it's uh, $1 to $3. So we by, are by far most inexpensive. The volume is very big. The influence to the GDP in Jordan is so big that the, they can pay us easily out of the additional tax income. So the important, uh, and thank you for the question, yeah, is who is bridging the initial financing? And we talked to some countries, I want to not mention the names, yeah, but big countries uh, in Africa. And it's only the question how to bridge. And now in Switzerland and London, there are groups forming uh, who will do this as an impact investment and, uh, and help it because thank you what you said, yeah, it's really a human right. Water should be a human right. And it should be organized. And when there are no, when there are no uh, other structures, yeah, it's of course something interesting for an entrepreneur and inventor. And at the end, it's all regional. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you can help very fast. When we sign a contract, we are there in the country in two, uh, two months later. And we can operate when the humidity is there the day afterwards. So it's not a question of timing. And, it's not an, and here was the meeting about infrastructures. Yeah? Think about desalination. No country in Africa can afford really big desalination. Yeah? But most of the people live near the coast. And we can pull in the humidity from the coast 100 kilometers to 150 kilometers, depends if there are hills or not there. And then it, uh, it rains. We recreate and revitalize the structure which was there before climate change. We change climate change, experts say, not me only. <laughs> which means you have the situation like 40, 50 years ago. All right. Uh, so we come to the question of financing because Dr. Flores mentioned that whole question of financing. And I do want to come back to a cyclone, uh, Idai and cyclone Kenneth, because your research uh, from your uh, in reinsurance company shows that uh, over 2017 and 2018, the industry paid about $219 billion in claims from weather-related events. But for Cyclone Edai, um, your company, though, re reported that the overall economic loss for Mozambique, Malawi, and Zimbabwe was in the order of uh, $2 billion, of which only 7% will be covered by the insurance, leaving a gap of uh, about 93%. That is a huge gap. Indeed, indeed it is. And uh, we're talking very big uh, numbers and uh, alluding to what uh, Helmut said, climate change, challenge is not something in the, in the future. No. Uh, it's something which is here and now, and it's massive. And uh, if you look at it in relative terms, we're always talking about uh, tropical cyclone in the United States or flooding in Europe, but uh, IDAI in Mozambique basically represents 15% of GDP of the, of the country. No. It's gonna throw back the country in its development uh, several, several years. And so, yes, obviously, these uh, events are devastating. Human tragedies, more than a 1,000 uh, dead people. Uh, I think a lot of them could have been uh, prevented uh, with better, uh, better uh, prevention. Uh, then, obviously, people lose their houses, uh, lose their businesses. Uh, still now, a lot of people are sleeping in tents, uh, no roof about, uh, yeah. above their head. And, yes, an impact on, on a whole region, a whole, uh, a whole uh, economy. And then, yes, uh, I think you have alluded to uh, the various dimensions. We are talking about prevention, very important, uh, and your technology plays into that uh, area. 
we are talking about the disaster management when something happens. <laughs> and then afterwards, we talk about the, the relief, uh, disaster relief, the emergency uh, aid, and obviously then the, the financing uh, part, uh, which can come from, from insurance, uh, from governance, from, uh, from donations. And if it doesn't come from any of these areas, uh, it's basically people's savings. Most of them don't have savings. It means it's a real economic loss, yeah. which they yeah. cannot yeah. Uh, not recover. Yeah. Uh, and it's true that uh, in Africa, uh, the insured part of these losses is significantly lower than globally. It's globally, it's low. It's only about one third of uh, values are on average uh, insured. But uh, in Africa, it's, uh, it's below 10 percent. Uh, For me, as a member of the industry, it's frustrating. I look at uh, a two billion economic loss. Then uh, I see uh, there's less than uh, a 200 million insured loss. I look at our own loss. And I say, I'd be happy to pay more. You know, uh, it, it's really an insignificant economic loss for uh, Swiss Re. And the reason is because the penetration of insurance is uh, so low. So we have a massive task ahead of us as a, as a system uh, with, uh, with all our partners, with stakeholders, with government, with regulators, uh, with, uh, with NGOs, with the insurance uh, associations, with technology uh, firm, all together we need to increase uh, penetration of uh, insurance as a solution to provide people relief after such an event. Immediate relief, they need the money right after the, uh, after the event, so, so yes. So in terms of increasing that low penetration, and you're talking about uh, the insured part of Africa being below 10%, help us to understand what countries like Mozambique though can do to bridge that gap and meet your requirements. So it's, I think one very important element is we, we all come together. So as I said before, government, regulator, uh, insurance companies, but then uh, we need technology firms. Uh, we need uh, ecosystems, platforms, because <coughs> historic insurance products are probably too complex and not affordable for people with low income. So we need to design very simple products, very efficient uh, uh, distribution, and there's very, very simple um, claims payment. So for example, if you have a small amount and have a loss adjuster going out there making the adjustment, maybe an alternative is to think in terms of parametric solutions so that the, uh, you make a payout immediately if a certain weather condition is given. So if you have a, a hurricane above a certain strength, that triggers the payout, and a few days later, the money, is, uh, the, money, the money is there. So I think there is solutions. Uh, there's a lot of good examples uh, from different countries in the, in the world, in China, in Latam, in Kenya. We did some really cool stuff with, uh, with, uh, with farmers, uh, but so much more to, to, to do. And I think it's a, a real big task uh, we have as a, as a, as a, as a system all, all together. So this is a collective uh, responsibility for all stakeholders, President Fora, because um, businesses and, and uh, African governments and uh, uh, the, the citizens as well all have a role to play in uh, building resilience and combating uh, uh, the effects of climate change. So if you can just tell us how governments and business leaders can work together to identify these uh, climatic risks so as to invest in building resilience. Yeah. No, but uh, before we, we go further, I think we, today we stand in solidarity and of course our prayers uh, with uh, <coughs> the sister island in the Bahamas uh, because they too are, are feeling uh, the same pain as our countries, the three countries in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Mozambique, Malawi and, and Zimbabwe. Uh, the three speakers before me, uh, when I've spoken on insurance, uh, Malisa on uh, the role of the science and the data and of course the technology. So, uh, at the end of the day, I think uh, governments are there to serve the nation, serve citizens. And it is about the type of design that we need to put in place. Uh, certainly, I would say 10 years or 20 years ago, the whole structure of government was not designed to deal with the problem of, uh, of climate change. 
we, we take the example of, of Mozambique. Mozambique has gone to 20 years of civil war. And at the end of civil war, uh, they, they put in place uh, a political system to, to build a nation. No attention was given on the type of roads to be resilient enough to stand up with a cycle. The type of houses were never built for that. So basically, it has eroded more than 20 years of efforts in Mozambique. And I recently met the, the president in Mozambique. I, 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 uh, I had a state visit in Mozambique, and I saw for myself uh, the pain that they now need to, the pain that they needed to go through, and also uh, the courage that they need to get inside from the people for them to reconstruct the country. So it's, it's really now, from the point of view of policymakers, is rethinking how do we redesign? What type of houses do we, we need to prepare? The type of roads that we need to have in place, the type of infrastructure. And all this comes with a cost. And, uh, and I think this is where the international community hmm. needs to come into place. I don't think it's a question that we, we are there, we, are, uh, we have the capacity and capability to, to solve these problems on our own. And it is a collective responsibility of the international financial organizations to come into place. And here I want to challenge the existing financial architecture in the world today. Uh, because we do not take the issue, the subject matter of climate change as, as a factor when we, when, we go, when we go about in giving uh, support to other countries. And I think this is what is needed today in, uh, in the new international financial governance. We need to factor the, the problems that countries uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, island states, in the Pacific, Indian Ocean, and Caribbean. So I think uh, we call for a new uh, global order in, uh, in the fight against global warming and climate change, so that we put systems in place to better serve the citizens mm. and serve humanity. Let's talk about those systems that need to be put in place, uh, and this, uh, what is needed, though, from both the public and the private sector in terms of planning, in terms of preparing and responding to natural disasters, because government, it seems, is uh, doing its part. Well, there's, there's, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a starting point where we need to build some form of trust in our collaborations amongst the different, the different sectors, whether it's within the scientific community and the private sector and, um, and the government. In most cases, we do have solutions that can actually support government coming from the scientific and the, and, 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 and the private sector communities. However, the prioritization of the funding by our governments is something that government needs to look at in order to make sure that the solutions that have been put in place or have been developed are actually operationalized and actually mainstreamed within government, uh, government decision. So let me make an example. So when we, South Africa is a space agency, um, and uh, there's a policy, national policy that uh, governs this, there's an act that governs this, there's a strategy that governs this. And when you think of that, you think all the instruments, uh, policy re uh, and governance related instruments are put in place. The institution is properly legislated to be in place. So what is missing? The finance to actually deliver on the promise that has been put into the, into the, into the strategy. When we ask for finance for whether it's satellite built programs or in this particular case, just platforms to enable the data that we already have, these decades of information, which through other platforms is now available for free because we've got advocacy for entities like the Group on Earth Observations that have enabled that globally we have free access to satellite data at high resolution, so it's not just low resolution data, it's high resolution data. When you put this in front of government, you, government responds with, how am I supposed to put money on a technology to do that when I need to build houses, when I need to give people food, when I need to create employment? This is a question. But actually the question is also the other way around. What is your choice if you do not invest in this? 
How are you going to know that the houses you're wanting to build, you're not building yeah. in a floodplain? How you do not know that that's a 100-year floodplain? You might know that in your lifetime, there has been no flood, but that could be a 50-year floodplain or a 100-year floodplain. And you build those houses, and tomorrow, Cyclone Idawo comes, and all of those houses are gone. So it's, it also comes in terms of the drought and food security. You want to spend money on giving people food. So it's good and well. You can give the farmer the seed to plant. But how do you know and support the farmer for the farmer to know that it's time for them to plant because the weather is coming for them to plant? How does the farmer know yep. that they need to fertilize a particular part of their land? Because you have no monitoring system. You've right. given them the seed. But the, this partnership and the trust needs to be built between these three sectors to actually, because from a scientific yep. fact, uh, entities as well is we do not operationalize. We look at private sector to take what we've put in place and they operationalize. But we look at our governments to fund these operational, these operational platforms. So governments, I think they need to relook at how they incentivize the science that they've already put out funds to happen. Because we fund it actually to do the science, but we're not funded to make the science work for government and actually provide solutions, solutions to government. Right. You want I to respond to that? I fully agree with, uh, uh, with you. There's a lot of elements which are already there. No data, we have tons of data. Already. When we talk about uh, hurricanes, we have 50, 60 years. We, we know the patterns. We can quite well, not exactly, but quite well uh, predict what might uh, happen. Uh, technology as well, marvelous technology, and we can deal with uh, millions of uh, data, uh, data pieces. And by the way, we are using satellite uh, technology, which probably you have uh, developed for an agricultural insurance program yes. in, in Kenya, where we use the, the pictures uh, from, uh, from space to see if the fields are green, brown, or yellow. And depending on that, you know if it's uh, normal conditions or if it's drought and uh, if there is going to be a payout. But I think the challenge is to bring all these elements together you know, into one system, create an ecosystem with the right incentives. Uh, with the right technology, with the right uh, data, with the financing part, uh, but then as well with transparency and information, creation, creating awareness amongst um, uh, potential customers uh, to buy uh, insurance. Uh, so it's, it seems that all the pieces are around, but we don't manage all of us here around yeah. the table and yeah, other yeah, stakeholders yeah, yeah, to bring yeah, it yeah, together. Yeah. So yeah. in terms of trying to bring that together, let me bring you back to uh, you know, the insurance and how um, uh, African countries are covered by that. How are insurers, though, helping Africa in this regard? We try to help uh, in, in the three dimensions, as I, I mentioned before. One is really prevention, and we have already spoken quite about it. Building codes, uh, for example, or uh, where. Uh, are you allowed to build in, in which areas, in very exposed areas, or, uh, or not, uh, all these things, education, uh, and so on. Then how to manage an actual um, uh, disaster. Uh, we have uh, a team, public uh, sector solutions team, with a lot of expertise in this uh, area as well, supporting, uh, supporting uh, gov uh, governments. And then obviously, again, the, 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 relief, uh, the relief part. Capital and capacity in Africa is not a limitation. No. I mentioned before our exposure, despite the fact that we are a market leader in Mozambique, is very limited. We could write so much more. So from this perspective, so, uh, supply is not, not the issue. But uh, supply and demand do not meet yeah. because actually what we offer <laughs> is maybe not what the consumers need or can uh, afford. So we need to, the supply and the demand curve, we need to make them match at one point of uh, time. Affordability, I think, yes, what we offer now is for most people not uh, affordable. We can influence affordability, obviously one is by increase of income of the consumers, but by making products more efficient, by more efficient distribution, but as well by subsidies uh, from governments, at least as a kickstart. Uh, in the beginning, uh, as well, uh, donations uh, in, the, in, in the beginning. The, the tools are there. Uh, we need to, I think we, all together, we need to be, do a better job of uh, making it work from the, uh, 
helping to make here the world less vulnerable, more resilient to these events. I think we need to catch up, Marshall. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. it, I think we need to catch up. Yeah. 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 You know, science is there for us. Government, we need to understand. Policymakers, we need to understand the science. Uh, the technology is there. How do you, how do you make uh, available this technology to other countries? How international partners come into play? Yeah. You know, we are running out of time. Yeah. We, we have to act with yeah. the speed of the problem, exactly. not with the speed of burgers. And here are the, uh, uh, four players, let's say, yeah, but there are many more. Yeah. The most important thing I noticed in the last month is that the silos are still too strong, and you mentioned it. Yeah, you have to have better access to the. We talk about uh, severe weather events. Yeah, we 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 will never. Nobody. Yeah, can stop them. They will happen, but they are a small part. Maybe only five percent of the whole damages. Ninety-five percent is the drought in Africa. Yeah, we have to talk for one minute about that, because there are more people killed, uh, more children suffer. It's not only the, the, the wrong water quality, it's no water. Yeah? And when you look at the whole chain, and therefore many more are interested to solve it, you have water, and if you don't have water, you don't have food, you don't have jobs, you are forced in migration, you are forced in immigration, Europe, Arabian countries, and then the whole system yeah, is, becomes instable. So uh, I look at our company uh, now as a national an international security company. Yeah? Okay. And this we discussed also in Munich on the MS uh, Munich Security Forum. Because 10 years ago, I spoke with a head of water in the Ministry of uh, Agriculture, and they were sitting, excuse me, at the end of the table in, in the cabinet. Today, it's always with the president. And that's right. And they should join. And I think the 20 new heads of states in Africa this year, they have a huge opportunity and challenge that they started. They have to do something. And it's not the money. You are fully right. There is so much money everywhere. Yeah? But it has to be organized and a little bit shaked. The European governments are existing. They want to do something. They have to do something. But they are slow. The African countries, are, uh, governments are new. They are not coordinating uh, among their neighbors and so on. But it's getting better. And if this comes together, and um, according to where we are sitting, yeah, uh, the, the forum yeah, is committed uh, for improving the state of the world. Yeah? There has to be something, a kick. Yeah? And it, it's not necessary many people. Yeah? What I heard yesterday from Professor Schwab was that there will be joint contracts between uh, the, uh, the, the United Nations and the forum to help to bring private uh, public partnership together with the government easier. Of course, we are dedicated to do jobs within the SDG world because the SDGs are all related to so many businesses and industries, yeah? And we have to take care in our own interest not to kill everything, yeah? Because like the financial people, they must take care of their investments. If somebody invested in, in, in uh, North Africa right. and now the Sahara moves into the Mediterranean, yeah? Their land has no value anymore. They are also interested. And this is, I believe, Mr. President, that if there is now a little movement, which is a nucleus, and which maybe starts here or somewhere, but now, yeah, then we will see a big change. Because there is a big interest. And I only can add, I was invited by the uh, uh, eight biggest faiths. They have an organization where their project managers and, and finance uh, uh, experts sit together. Uh, they are 80 people, they present 5.6 billion people, and they have 3.3 trillion US under management. They are also interested to coordinate. And there is much more behind the curtain already existing, yeah, where they think, but there has to be somebody to invite them, yeah, maybe to the Seychelles. It's, everybody loves to go there, yeah. <laughs> to sit together. Yeah. Yeah, they can come, eh? Yeah, they come, yeah. They can come, anytime. Uh, you have enough hills that you will be not drowned, yeah? yeah. All right. Okay. I, I'd like to take some questions from the floor because I'm sure you have uh, quite a, some questions for uh, members of our panel. If Yes, uh, at the front here. Uh, if we can have a microphone at the front. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, I, I, I'm going to come from the finance aspect. I'm from the insurance sector. They don't feel that I'm, I'm attacking the insurance industry. 
how are we going to finance this whole um, challenge of climate change when people are still living on a dollar a day, right? What part of that dollar are they going to give to us insurance companies to insure them against such disasters? Now, the other question that I have, and this is in particular for you, Mr. President, is we, we all know that there is financing available, there's solutions available, there's the science, there's the data, there's the insurance, there's all of that. Um, but as of today, although most of Western countries are the ones with the highest carbon emission, the financial flow in Africa is probably 2% of the global flow. So what are you governments are doing to get more of that money into our continent so we can finance all the things that are available? Thank you. We'll take another comment before. Yes, at the back here. In the meantime, you can go ahead, Bert. Yes. So uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, point you know, that uh, affordability is a, is a challenge. Now, insurance has a penetration or a share of the GDP in Africa uh, in most countries below 1%. You know? so there's a couple of countries where it has 3 to 4. South Africa is the only exception where it's above 10, uh, 10%. So I, I agree with you, it's a very long way to, to get to everybody and to have 100% inclusion. But now we are still setting, what we are providing is solutions basically to industrial risk, to corporate risk, to commercial risks, and to high income people. Now there's still millions and millions of people who are somewhere in the middle income segment or in the lower income segment. The last few years there has been a significant growth of people in Africa included in the financial system. And in the meanwhile, there is platforms available. We all have them on, uh, on our uh, iPhones. iPhones where transactional costs or frictional costs are minimum. So you, in the meanwhile, we can offer insurance products with a premium of uh, one or two dollars per month in an, in an efficient way. So I agree with you to cover everybody now. It's a long journey, but there's so much more we can do to reduce the, the protection gap massively in the next few years. President Fowry. No, what we've been doing, what we've been doing, we've been uh, insisting that the green climate fund is replenished. And I think this is very important because uh, this has been international uh, pledged by industrial countries. And uh, this is a subject matter that will be discussed uh, in the margins of the United Nations General Assembly around the 23rd of September. So our role as small states and our role as members of the African Union is to insist that the Green Climate Fund is replenished and all, uh, all the, the countries that uh, made their pledge, they commit themselves and they put the money there. Right, we'll take exactly. the comment from the back. Uh, let me stand up. Hi, I am Barka from the, I'm a global shaper from the Port Hub Hub uh, in Mauritius another small island developing state. And uh, one of the questions that I was asking myself was about finance, but that has already been addressed. Um, the other thing that I was wondering is, there is an increasing uh, move to include climate change as a security issue. There are some countries who have insisted that this be part of the UN Security Council even. Is this something um, that should be framed as a defense and security issue in Africa for it to gain uh, more traction more funding and more attention and political will. Thank right, you. I'll throw that to the floor. No, I, I think uh, I think Seychelles. Yes. <coughs> I think Seychelles. We we have been uh, we have been talking about uh, the issue of uh, how do we uh, treat the issue of climate change as a security issue. And recently, I was attending the the SADC, uh, meeting, and I think this is something that we are discussing. We will also push in the next uh, uh, heads of government meeting in, uh, in February next year. And it has to be featured high on the, on the peace and security agenda of the African Union. Thank you. Another question at the back? Um, if you allow me, I'm going to speak in French. So, um, <coughs> ce que je voudrais dire, c'est une autre dimension, monsieur. What I'd like to mention maybe is something else, something else that we would need to take uh, into account, a question of ch climate change. 
and the impact that it can have on jobs. Maybe I should say that I belong to ILO, the International Labour Organization, and according to our studies, when or if there is an increase in temperature of a few percent, but if we keep the, our forecast as they are nowadays, we will have a loss of job. Uh, uh, about 80 million of jobs will be lost, and this for this represent a huge loss and. As I repeat, 80 million employments will disappear for the African continent, especially Western Africa. No, it's a comment, madam, if I may. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm taking questions, sir. Okay. No, it's a, it's a comment. Uh, uh, about also the social dimension and also about uh, jobs uh, in the, uh, uh, related to the climate change. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, go ahead. Always when mankind faced the problem, they found a solution, yeah? and new jobs were created. And uh, I think uh, it's, we are a small part uh, to contribute. Yeah? There will be a lot of additional effects. Yeah? We create now in Jordan what the uh, Royal Court uh, testifies around in a small country, uh, 15,000 jobs a year, and it goes further. Uh, we calculated for Kenya in 10 years uh, 800,000 new jobs yeah? because farming will develop and the follow up. So I'm not negative about that. Well, I'm negative, and this is what you mentioned before, is uh, to prevent and to have this meeting soon, the wars on water. The boundary waters and so on are the biggest uh, 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 threat I see in Africa, where you share, you know, the Nile problematic and so on. I mustn't mention it. Everybody knows in the room, yeah? Um, and this is something where I see the biggest problem. And if you can solve this, yeah, like they solve it now in Jordan with Israel and the others again, yeah, to rebuild Syria, how they solve it between Mexico and California, this is the most important thing. Because if there is a model how to solve it, yeah, and you, pr uh, you uh, prepare it with your data, and that's so important, I, I can tell you, before, when I started these uh, uh, inventions, and I got all this data, I must say, I'm absolutely fascinated how these persons are uh, uh, preparing the best data to handle and to understand our daily life much better. Yeah? Right. And therefore, with this data, and then the transportary water prevention, uh, water, this is so important. So we're going to wind up in a minute. I'm told I have five minutes left, and I want to get a commitment from all of you on the floor. I know, um, Melissa, you have something to, to say here. But let me start with you, President Foray, your uh, takeaways from this uh, situation and your personal commitment uh, at the World Economic Forum for Africa. So over the next uh, three years, though, what would be the one solution you will implement or you think should be implemented to deal with the effects of climate change in your country or in Africa? Very briefly, we have a very short time. No. I think as, as, as a state and as a leader, as a president of the country, we have taken a series of decisions. We need to implement the decisions. We cannot have summit after summit. I think we need to implement the decisions. And we can also, we can only implement the decisions that we have taken whereby partners that have pledged to put the money, they also do their bit. So it's a, it's a partnership. As Melissa said, there has to be trust. It takes two to tango. Thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Flora. That's a clear call to action. If we don't act now, yeah, we are losers. And we lose more, not only for our next generation, it's already us. Yeah? We are not so old that we will not see it. Yeah? And uh, I hope that we can roll out. Yeah? Financing is uh, ready. The people are ready. We are happy to help. Yeah? But there has to be a PPP, yeah? private partnership. Yeah? And, uh, well, and when the session is finished, we can talk. And this one. From the Earth Observations community, our pledge is very clear. We have a data platform that goes back 50 years of satellite imagery covering the whole of the continent, Digital Earth Africa. And the invitation is tap into this. 
platform and actually see what you can see of your country. The questions around security, uh, whether climate change should be a security issue, all you need to do is to view the change of water issues and, and transboundary issues. Here's a platform where if you're sitting in Zimbabwe, you can see what your fellow countrymen or neighbors are doing with the same water source that you're dependent on because you're downstream up north. The issue and the impact in Mozambique on, on, from Idao was not about the amount of rainfall that fell within Mozambique. It's the amount of water that came from the neighboring countries. We need to actually start looking at this issue as going across boundaries. It's not about what each country is doing, it's about what do you understand about what's yeah. happening even in your neighboring countries to enable you to put proper response mechanism in your own country. And we have a platform to actually enable all yeah. countries and we invite private sector to come into this platform and develop solutions for the local communities, solutions that talk to the communities. We cannot say data is an issue anymore. We're no longer there. We cannot say the processing platforms because it's big data is an issue anymore. We're making the commitment. Thank you to the Australian government and the Helmsley Foundation for actually allowing us, for, for Africa to be the first continent to build a data cube that's continent wide. All we can now need to do is to show, can it actually help our governments and us as society to make better decisions? Right, that. So I guess from from Swissery, you get more than a commitment. Uh, this is actually the, the purpose. This is the reason why we exist as uh, Swissery, uh, to make the world more resilient and to help narrowing that protection gap. And it's actually one of the main reasons why when I was looking for a new job end of last year, I decided to move with my family uh, 11,000 kilometers further south to Cape Town to work with my teams uh, and uh, together make a contribution to, to the continent, uh, dedicate my, my energy, my, my life, my passion to, although it's gonna be a small one, but to make an impact and uh, make sure that we have next uh, IDAI in, in Mozambique in, in a few years, uh, the, the relevance of our system, uh, uh, the tragedy is gonna, gonna be minor than, than it is now. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end of our session, uh, Combating Africa's Climate Challenges. Thank you very much for your interest and your patience. And may I thank my uh, distinguished panelists, His Excellency Danny Forey, President of the Seashells, Director uh, Andisam Lisa, uh, Dr. Helmut Fura, and uh, Bert Estrebel. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, this is now a wrap. Good evening. Thank you.